All right, you're all set. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I think everyone is just the five of us right now, but um, hello. Welcome to the regularly scheduled TSO meeting. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Okay, so I will, um, as we're waiting for at least another one or two, I think members to show, just do a quick roll call to make sure that everyone can, oh, here's Shalini. Hi, Shalini, welcome Shalini. Hello. Hi there. Okay, so we're just gonna do a quick call, make sure everyone can, well, we know Shalini can be here, heard, so mm -hmm. Shalini is yes, yeah, she's present. Okay, Andy. I'm here. Anna. Present. Okay, uh, Paul. Present. Okay, and Athena. I'm here. Okay, wonderful. All right, so uh, before we go into uh, public comment, I just wanted to give a quick uh, frame of the hopes and actually necessity for tonight's meeting that we as a committee will be able to close the meeting with decisions on what TSO, if anything, intends to act on by the end of this term and what we intend to, to put on the carryover memo with the goal that by the next meeting, we would have a draft and we would really be able to have a detailed, robust carryover member that uh, carry memo rather that captures input from all of the members. Um, so it's very clear for the next TSO committee and council. So I just wanted to give that an overall framework and hope that we can all be on board and feel really accomplished that we leave this meeting that way. Uh, so I would like to, I do not know if we have any, oh, okay. All right, so we do have, okay, uh, Mandy Joe. we have Mandy Joe with us. So we have both Mandy Joe and Tracy. Um, thank you both for being here. We're going to move on to uh, public comment if we have any public comment, I'm looking to you, Tracy. Um, please raise your hand. There you are. Okay, may we please bring uh, Tracy into the room. And then we can welcome uh, Mandy Jo in as well too, please. Okay, am I in the room? You are, hello, hello, the floor is yours. Great, okay. Um, so I just wanted to uh, be here for public comment. I had misunderstood last time and I was under the impression I would be a panelist for the streetlights discussion, but, and so I didn't make a public comment. So I just wanted to, um, I'll try to be brief because I know you have a lot uh, of agenda. Tracy, actually we do have a long agenda, but also, so um, for last meeting, like I was understood that you want to have a longer public comment. So. Um, you may do so now. Oh, okay. okay, I'll still I'll still try to keep it short. So, okay. All right, um, so I am the chair of TAC, as everyone knows, um, and so we're currently short a member. Um, we did meet to we were going to meet to discuss the streetlights policy last week, but we didn't have a quorum, so we didn't meet. So TAC doesn't have any formal comments. Um, except for the comments that we made way back months ago when the policy the streetlights policy was much different. Um, so therefore, the comments I'm making tonight um, here are mine alone, and they reflect my background as a transportation safety researcher in the many studies and reports that I've read on roadway lighting and nighttime safety. Um, so first, I wanted to just thank the sponsors, Councilors Haneke and Devlin Gothier. Um, they've done a lot of work to get the proposed streetlights policy to where it is now. And we are very appreciative of their efforts and the meetings that Councillor Haneke had with E. Vogel over the summer and the revisions that they made to the policy to include more consideration of transportation safety 
and night then was part of the original proposal back in August 2022. Um, so although one may get a different impression when reading the memo that they had submitted to the last meeting, and I didn't see any materials in the packet for this meeting, but um, I, I do think that there's more common ground and agreement between um, the sponsors, myself and Eve Vogel, than it may appear. Um, so, um, and Eve is not here tonight, so I'll try not, I don't really want to speak for her so much, but as she wrote in her memo, you know, both Eve and I do approve of reducing the glare and having more shielded lighting and more lighting that's pedestrian friendly. And we feel like good lighting reduces light pollution and glare and has benefits for transportation safety and not for just for dark skies in the environment. And we agree with the proposal to replace Amherst LED streetlights, which based on the memo, I understand have currently memo that the council sent currently have over like are over 5,000 K lighting um, with lighting of a lower temperature, um, such as lighting in the 3,000 to 4,000 range as this lighting, the lower range lighting is better for safety, dark skies in the environment. And we also support the creation of a street lights task force to help implement the policy, um, which including the second part of the policy, which wasn't included in this iteration. Um, I also too, think too that there are some places where even I don't fully agree with the sponsors, but I'm hoping that the counselors, I mean, the Streetlights Task Force, if the if TSO and the council agree to create it or can address some of those issues. So um, just a few other comments is that in the sponsors memo, they, they said that there were some of our recommendations that they didn't support because they, for example, they thought that they would increase harm to public health, I mean, to human health. And the memo cited the American Medical Association's 2016 guidance that said the general maximum um, CCT for street lighting should be 3000K to reduce the harmful health effects of LED lights. But after the AMA came out with that recommendation, a number of experts, including the IES, which I know they like to cite, um, questioned the AMA's stance on this, and the IES board issued a statement saying that the AMA's recommendation lacked scientific foundation and does not assure the public of any certainty of health benefit or risk avoidance. I um, mean, more recently, in the last few years, there's been studies from the National Academy of Sciences and the US Department of Energy that found that generally that roadway lighting has no negative health impacts regardless of the CCT because the lighting levels, the dosage that people are exposed to from roadway lighting is too low and that the main impacts of the artificial lighting is in indoor settings. Um, but we do know that there are health benefits of having good nighttime lighting in terms of safety to reduce fatalities and that better nighttime lighting can encourage more walking and biking and other activities that we want to promote as a community. Um, there is some disagreement too with the sponsors um, and with Eve and I about the, um, the maximum lighting levels that should be considered on arterial roadways. I won't get into those details. They're in my written comments. Um, but I guess I'll just say that in general, I tend to err on the side of caution with safety and recognize that you know, with the population that we have, which is transit dependent. I mean, there are a number of transit dependent people and people who walk and bike at night. And in New England, sometimes night is at four or 5 p.m. So, you know, just by necessity, sometimes people are walking or biking on arterial roadways. And, um, and even if they don't have sidewalks and so on. So in the memo, um, they had mentioned too that it seemed that even I were, basically trying to overlight the town and use street lighting as the only traffic safety measure. Um, I disagree with that. Um, I'm really happy with all the different measures that Amherst has undertaken in recent years to improve traffic safety around town and the measures that are still coming up. Um, and I 100% agree that there should be, that we should be doing other work as well. I mean, they make the point that you know, with certain types of roads that you also want to look at speed limits and road widths and traffic calming and sidewalks and bike lanes. And I am 100% behind all of that. Um, and so I think the, the challenge though is that, I mean, there are roadways that people have been concerned about for a long time and they're not always getting fixed in a timely manner. I mean, some of it is budget, some of it is other priorities. And so in the absence of those and erring on the side of safety, 
I tend to think that we should continue to support like more street lighting until we have those other measures in place. And also, as I had mentioned earlier, just that if the town's current lighting is the LEDs are currently at 5,000 K and above, like even the recommendation that even I make to have 3,000 or 4,000 K lighting is an improvement. It's improvement for safety and for dark sky. So thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, thank you. Um, I see we have Dorothy's join us. Dorothy, can you hear? Could you? Yes. Hear? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> it's very, but uh, Dorothy has joined us at 7 12 p.m. Okay. So with that, we will move into our uh, into the street lights policy. There are some more people who've joined us in the audience. You might want to reannounce. Oh, okay. Let me see. All right. So before we conclude public comment, is there anyone else who would like to make public comment? Will you please raise your hand? If so, and we will happily bring you into the audience. Okay, I see no hands, so that will conclude our public comment period. And we will move on to the proposed street lights policy. Um, before I ask any questions, we have both Mandy and Anna with us, um, the sponsors. And so I'm going to I'm going to welcome you both back. Thank you. It's been so long since I've been at TSO. So. <laughs> um, Anika, are you looking for us to kick off? Yes, do you have anything that you would like from our last meeting to uh you know to share to overview before okay. we begin discussion? Mandy, do you have anything? specific? Um, not particularly. No, I think we're looking to continue the conversation from last time and, um, and figure out really what the reasonable next steps are. I think that, um, you know, I think one of the, the things that we often seek to do is uh, I think sometimes we seek consensus to a fault and at some point we need to move on things. And so I'm looking forward to some sort of movement um, on this in some way tonight. Uh, Andy, you have a question? Uh, it isn't really a question, but an opportunity to extend my remarks and comment from last time, because I think there's uh, some level of that I probably didn't state things as, uh, as fairly as I had wished, plus I had an opportunity to talk with Mandy since the meeting about some of this, and uh, mm -hmm. Basically, I, the idea of having a street light policy, I think, is is important. We actually have a street light policy, so it's a question of improving the street light policy that we have, which is really outdated and has a lot of deficiencies to it. And we have heard from various people in the community about the reason for wanting it. The things that I was raising last time that I'm st I was still struggling with um, uh, were about the amount of detail that should be placed in a policy and what should be left for uh, left for implementation decisions, either by the committee that we're forming or by the uh, staff that are required to implement it so that uh, um, I, I still am a little bit uncertain as to use of the highly technical standards. The other thing that, one of the things that I had raised as an additional issue that didn't come out in the last meeting because it was one of those add-on things that I referred to at one point that I had some other issues I've rethought about after talking Mandy in particular, and that is um, the whether we needed another new committee because 
I get worried about uh, Amherst committing itself to death and continuing to create new committees instead of uh, using the committees that it has more fully and uh, that uh, it seemed like uh, we were yet again creating another committee, which calls for staff to supervise it, calls for Paul to take the additional time to uh, find members and appoint to the committee. And uh, it, uh, I, I think that we really need to be very cautious about adding committees and as opposed to using committees more efficiently or subtracting from them. It is a discussion that we want to have, but I think that Mandy made a very good point that I want to acknowledge, and that is that I had said, well, why can't it be TAC? And the point that Mandy was making, and she might expand on this, is uh, that street lighting is not just a tra traffic issue, but involves uh, other areas of expertise that are represented by other standing committees. And so pulling it out as a traffic issue for singular focus may not be uh, one that looks at the full range of issues. So I wanted to alert, uh, sort of raise that issue again with a little clarity and, um, uh, you know, uh, if there's interest in it to follow through and hear a little bit more from Mandy about the various different interests that she was expressing that need to be considered um, as far as the expertise that we would want to bring together. And she was analogizing it to the uh, Solar Working Group when we talked as a committee that was trying to bring together people with uh, a large variety of expertise. So. Um, I think we need to just uh, come to an agreement on that and and uh, then be able to move forward, as Anna said, uh, that there comes a time where we have to draw things to a conclusion. Uh, so I, and I guess the last thing that I would want to say is, um, is that I had raised an issue a long, long time ago about uh, the need for consideration of street lighting for um, public safety purposes. And that that was the whole um, thing behind uh, a concept that was discussed for, oh, you know, back to uh, even before the council uh, called SEPTED, which is community policing through environmental design. And um, I think that our expert in the department, if I'm uh, not mistaken, is uh, uh, Bill Laramie. And um, I would hope that we consult with Bill and get his input on um, what needs to be considered as far as those kinds of issues. Uh, but uh, regardless, the purpose of SEPTED is to um, have safe streets, not safe skies. So I think that uh, um, they aren't entirely in conflict with each other, but it's just a, a perspective. So those are the points that I wanted to bring forward. And I really um, was trying to narrow it down so that we could uh, move forward. Thank you, Andy. Mandy, did you want to respond to that or you want to continue to take questions? I mean, I, I guess I can. Um, yeah, so I'll address the committee charge and the task force first. Um, when we brought the streetlights policy back to TSO, it came with a draft charge for a committee to create a committee that came out of conversations with Tracy and Eve. Um, there have been a lot of comments on that draft charge. And yes, as I explained to Andy, um, I think Anna and I are always also hesitant to create new committees or ask to create new committees for exactly the reasons Andy indicated. Um, but um, this is not necessarily an item that any one committee 
um, has the expertise for or would be appropriate in, even though it seems like street lights and transportation go together exactly. But as um, this committee has sort of watched this policy evolve because of discussions between concerns for health outcomes of people and animals and darkness and, and all of that, and also ensuring safe transportation corridors, the expertise and the knowledge when talking about um, what streets and what they border in terms of what appropriate lighting levels are remain with multiple people um, or multiple types of expertise. Um, if you're talking about trying to minimize the danger and damage to wildlife in conservation areas, the expertise for where those are and what um, and you know what types of animals are there don't necessarily sit with members of TAC um, as just one example um, of, of why a new task force might be best. Lighting design, standard like lighting design expertise does not necessarily sit with anyone who happens to be on TAC um, as, as a transportation issue. And um, so the, the request is to, well, the proposal is to create a new committee for that purpose. Um, that committee, as I said, the charge has had a lot of comments. Um, I, I wonder if, and I'm just gonna put this out there for TSO, um, there could be, the charge has not been reviewed by TSO really at all. Today would sort of be the first time really looking at it. Yet there has been a lot of comments about whether we even need a street lights policy, whether that, um, whether we would propose, whether the council, you know, whether the council should adopt a new street lights policy and an updated street lights policy, not necessarily do we need one. And so part of my thinking personally is, um, and as a sponsor is find out whether the council will adopt a new policy before spending time on getting the task force charge exactly right. Recognizing the time that exists and remains in this council. Um, just a thought. So, so we have not proposed any changes based on comments to the task force. Um, on to some of the other things Andy said, and I'll just try to be brief. Uh, location and placement standards, we've tried to add a little bit of leeway there. Um, well, we've tried to write it so that it is leeway, um, and leeway similar to what is currently written in the current policy, um, to which would, in my opinion, address Andy's concerns about SEPTED and that type of community policing lighting matters. Um, we've been operating under the current placement standards for 20 plus years and SEPTED has been in place and instituted during that time where I believe Andy has said some of those lights may have been added at that time. So mirroring the current placement standards of where lights go and all I think addresses the concern about whether the policy is flexible enough to um, allow for septed type lighting installations because of those concerns. Um, the biggest change in who makes some decisions is right now under the current policy, the select board, <laughs> is the one that makes the final decision on other locations as deemed necessary for additional illumination. We don't have a select board anymore. Um, so this policy is drafted that the town council would make those decisions. Um, right now, there is no body making those decisions if, if a placement and request for lighting, street lighting falls not under any of this ex um, specific locations. So I would just say that given that we've been operating with it for 20 years, the current draft provides the same flexibility for location that the 
policy, the current policy provides for those concerns. Thank you. Uh, Sean, I believe you are next. Sean? Yes. Could you just uh, have Dorothy? I'm just, I was just getting coffee and I was hoping Dorothy can go before me. Thank you. Okay. Dorothy, please go ahead. Hmm. Well, I want to say that the job of a town councilor is very complicated and we have no staff. So I have been very pleased to have the use of Tracy, who is a professional in the field of transportation and traffic um, and safety, to give her comments. Um, and I think that from the, the last word that I saw, that there was um, a lot of agreement, except some difference in terms of some lighting at some point. And I, I also want to remind you that I, as a counselor, was voted by people who um, live in residential neighborhoods and are concerned about their safety. Um, for me, and not just as a person, but for as a woman, lighting is extremely important. And number one, to walk safely without falling, given the condition of our roads, which you know are not in good shape and won't be for quite a while, um, to avoid falls and accidents. But mainly it's because dark spaces are frightening and seem to invite criminals. And I can I speak from experience, okay? So um, I personally have no opinion or any way to have an opinion of whether we need a task force or not. I think Andy's questions about how much detail are really valuable, but I can't answer those. Um, and um, I just think that we need to pay a little bit more attention to the fact that this is complicated. We are just people who've been chosen by other people. We are not experts. Um, and that we're gonna have to leave a lot of things to our staff. So. I would imagine they would have some suggestions as to what goes in. I mean, we don't want to have our, our a, a bylaw so specific that it has to be amended all the times. And I know you've said that you don't want that either. Um, so the question of what goes in the bylaw, what doesn't, I think should be done in consultation with staff. Um, and that we should realize that we can't fix everything, but that we are a government elected by people. And one of the things they're really concerned about is safety. and that involves residential streets and traffic streets that go to our homes. So I am not an expert. I'm not going to become an expert. And I don't want to vote on things that only an expert can vote on. So that's what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, Shalini. Um, so going along what Andy and Dorothy said, I have a more specific suggestion, which was that, and which is, I think, what Andy was implying with respect to the policy that if we could separate out which are the general guidelines towards creating a darker sky that's healthy and also maintaining safety, and then have regulations which are more going into specifics. And, and could also be potentially changing over time as we have newer fixtures or newer type of innovations and lighting. So I just want to offer this as an example, like with D2 uh, in the policy where it says, uh, nuisance, no street light luminaire shall create a lighting nuisance in the form of glare. Glare is declared to be da 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 da. And then going towards the end it's like this determination will be made by the superintendent of public works or the designee through site visit and visual inspection full stop and then maybe we didn't include bug rating for glare which should be higher than gi bug rating values of g3 or above i mean those could go into the regulation and that can be decided by the task force and i really do think we need a task force because of the reasons Dorothy you just said that counselors are not experts, but we have two counselors who have done a lot of work, the sponsors and done the research and so forth. And having them in a transparent process through a task force work with people like Tracy, 
uh, other experts, but also I would like to include in the task force residents, especially those who use biking and walking as their main mode of transportation, that I think it's really important to have the lived experiences of people. Like we, while we need the experts and the sponsors and different committees like TAC weighing in, but we also need residents because as we know, it's hard to always get access and feedback from public throughout mm. uh, you know, our process, but having some residents who have a lived experience be part of the task force uh, would you know benefit us in that way in providing a more holistic approach to that. So that those are the two main points that uh, I was going to offer. And then the other one is a smaller one, which was highlighted in Vo uh, Eve's um, memo about including IESRB handbook as the reference guide in the thing given that that manual is updated each year and it's very expensive so that not no one has really referred to it because it's so expensive so is that is that reference really important or could we include the other maybe include that but also include the other handbook or something that have been ref suggested mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I just had a comment as well um, and a question before uh, for the sponsors also um, before handing it over. Uh, so I just I wanted to share like and also to your point, um, Shalini, in terms of, you know, involving people uh, with lived experiences who use uh, walking and public transportation for their main form of, of getting around and navigating town. Um, I'm, be, I'm one of them, so I do appreciate um, how that was brought into the report. And I also just wanted to share, um, you know, again, I know I've said this a million times, but just I, I really appreciate really seeing the difference in, in the lighting and how the examples do highlight and light up dark areas. Mm -hmm. um, we know that we're starting to get uh, dark earlier. Um, I just, just last week um, ran into a resident of Chestnut Court, um, an elderly woman who was coming back from doing her errands. She had been walking to the senior center and she fell um, on the sidewalk in broad daylight. And she had what seems to be perhaps a broken nose. I mean, a big egg on her forehead, concussion, mm. um, knee banged up. And so, you know, this is something that happened in broad daylight you know, just on the sidewalk and the area that she walks on with the street lights and you can see the street, but they do not light up the sidewalk. So, you know, that same area where she would come, you know, back and forth to run errands will be black, you know, pitch black, you know, probably by 4.35 o'clock fairly soon. Um, and that's, you know, it's not as if that's uh, late at night. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but then I had just also a broader question for TSO. Um, it, I'm not sure if I understand correctly, Dorothy, it seems like you are saying you're not ready to vote. Um, Shalini, you're suggesting some edits. Um, mm -hmm. And Aiden, your comments have been very clear. So also, so my question again, with the time that we have is also to, um, the sponsors, you know, are, are we saying we want to go through this policy? Are this an edit? Are the sponsors open to that? Have you have you heard things Question. that you feel like would um, easily work in, in this policy? So really for the, where, where do you all stand right now with the comments that you've heard? Good job. I echo Dorothy. Good job. Um, I I didn't realize that was that ah, yeah. no, the nice thing. She did a good job of summing it up. She, she did. did a good job. No, I know. I agree. And Dorothy, I'm sure like I have said worse that I'm, I'm you know, you never know when the mic is on or off sometimes. Um, so that was a nice thing to get caught on a hot mic with. So um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think I can understand it going in either direction. Honestly, I think that what and so I, I'm curious to hear Mandy's thoughts. Um, I think that at some level it's at this point, I think it's really tough to, to completely split it out between uh, regulations and, and kind of a more of a, of a 
philosophy based statement um, because I think that what we what we were trying to do in the purpose of this when we what we were trying to do in the introduction was to get at that idea but we also have found that some that level of specificity um, sometimes is is necessary otherwise it's it's a lot easier for something to get dismissed um, and that whether it's a bylaw or, or regulations it will still need to be updated um, and so regularly and and that was part of the thing that we were trying yeah. to to bring us back in the process of doing with this was, you know, we shouldn't go this long between updates. Um, this is one of those things that it's a technology. Technology, we know changes so fast and we need to be able to stay on top of it. It will need to be updated no matter what. Um, and the council as keeper of the public way will be responsible for, for doing that in one capacity or another. And I think Dorothy, I wanted to just say um, something that your, your comment raised for me is, you know, I know that your, your district much of it is downtown. And, um, and I think my district is, is interesting because it spans a lot of different types of all residential neighborhoods, right? Like are all residential areas, whether or not they're neighborhoods. And it's, it's interesting to me to think about the, the difference in expectation that people have about their lighting based on where they live. I live closer to the outskirts of town because I wanted that, right? Like I wanted to be I didn't want neighbors right on top of me. I wanted a little bit of space. And that was one of the reasons why I, okay, m the biggest reason was that I found a house that was really cheap, but it was a, it was a nice element of that <laughs> um, because that's what I wanted. And I think while you are hearing from residents that want their, their much more densely packed neighborhoods to be lit well, I'm hearing from neighbors who are saying, please don't bring this into a space that I have enjoyed the night sky. I've enjoyed the, the quiet. I've enjoyed the dark for years and years. And that's why I want to be here. And so I think that, the, that what I want to articulate in that is one, that there are a lot of different things that are up for, for interpretation in terms of what we want. Right. But that what we actually need is better lighting. What we actually need is safe lighting. And that's what this policy is trying to do. We are not trying to create more dark corners of the world. We are not trying to illuminate uh, you know, comfortable dark corners of the world. We're trying to create lighting that is, it's, it's again, we are not taking away any of these lights. What we are saying is we need lighting that is doing what it is supposed to do, which is illuminating those sidewalks to Anika's point, which is making it so that it's illuminating the sidewalk, not the entire yard of the house next to it. Um, and so that's the intention. And, and, and I know that it's a lot of technical jargon. And so I am asking for some trust that the standards that are written in there, the technical ones are getting at that intention of we are making healthy, safe, good lighting not that we are trying to eliminate all lighting. That has not. That is not the goal here. We're trying to change the lighting that we have to be, to still be safe and to meet those needs of of what good lighting can do. Um, so that was my my small soapbox for the evening, if that's okay. And Mandy, I'd love to give Mandy a spot because I just talked for like seventeen minutes. Mandy, did you? Not that long. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, Anna said things very well. Um, you know, as a counselor, we've voted on very technical things. And I like to point to the water and sewer regulations that were quite technical with technical terms that none of us really understood the difference of or the meaning of until we asked the questions. That's what committee meetings are for to to get an understanding of what's going on and what things mean and this committee did a very good job with that with sewer and water regs with things like I, I don't even know something with stop was in the terms you know <laughs> and, and and things that you know we didn't even know what they were until we read technical definitions that's that's what policies and regulations are um I in some sense, this policy proposal is probably a combination of a policy and a regulation, or if we want to equate it to the rental permitting bylaw, a combination of a what would in rental permitting look like a bylaw and a regulation. The council's writing the regulations for the bylaw to go with rental permitting right now. Um, you know, could they be split out? Maybe, maybe not. Um, 
this has always been as keeper of the public way. We structured it as a policy because currently there is a policy and we're looking to replace that policy. Um, technical definitions and, and things like that are there to aid in applying the policy and the regulations. If we were to split these up, we would have to decide who has the ability to create the regulations, who has the ability to amend the regulations. And is that a public body or is that a department head? Um, you know, who who's doing that and and all. Um I I, I will say um giving this specificity that also has flexibility in it that creates outer bounds allows for that implementation. Um, um, I think someone said um, the implementation decisions of to what to choose and how to choose. I think even Eve and Tracy in their memos or public comments said, you know, in the end, some of these statements and and decisions being made in the policy are those outer limits um without necessarily saying it must be a street light on a utility pole and we can't come off of utility poles you know it's it's giving or it must be at 25 feet we're saying it should be no higher than 25 feet but maybe we can come off utility poles maybe we can have three foot high walking lights if that is more fiscally feasible and logical for where the sidewalk is and who's walking on it versus biking or what the use is. That this allows for those implementation decisions to be made while complying with things like color temperature, making sure there is no glare, making sure everything is shielded and making sure it lights the parts of the public way we want lit you know, um, without being too prescriptive as to what it um, does. Um, yeah, so I guess that that's much of, oh, um, Shalini asked about the IES. Um, having a standard and referencing a standard can be extremely important, whether that be an outside document or you put the standards into the policy. Um, it's important to have standards. Um, otherwise, um, you get kind of what we have now, which is no standards. Um, and when lighting is happening, we, it, you know, what in, in an informal conversation I had, Anna and I had with the superintendent of public works, we said, well, how do you determine what lights go where and what their strength and what their brightness and all is, he says, well, I, I go to my supplier and they tell me what to do. We don't have standards, you know, and, and we don't know what the supplier is using. We don't know what standards the supplier is using or whether the supplier is just, you know, what have they referenced? What haven't they referenced? And so putting standards into a policy and saying, hey, this is what we want you to follow makes perfect sense because then people know why decisions are being made. Thank you. Um, Dorothy. Well, Mandy has put her finger on why I'm uncomfortable. When we did water and sewer, Anna acted as a facilitator and we had Amy Rusecki there. I, ne I never felt that Anna was telling me how to do the water and sewer. I felt that she was organizing a system where we could ask questions of the experts, the town people who are who do this work. Um, and you know, I, I'm sure she added some some things here and there, but it wasn't that that she was making the suggestions, that she was facilitating a discussion that we found organized and satisfactory. Um, so that's that's really what the problem is. Um, I, I just feel uncomfortable about it. So I really want to ask Paul, because we're coming down and saying, shouldn't some of these things be decided by town staff? <clears throat> And that's that's our question. So I think you know when you do ask town staff, um, the answer is we talk to our supplier. 
I mean, we do have, you know, the way we handle this, we have an electrician who's up on a bucket truck fixing things. And, you know, and he knows a lot about our current systems. I think town staff, you know, they've reviewed this, uh, the superintendent has at least. Um, and, you know, I think they would welcome the sort of direction uh, of what the council wants to achieve. And right now, you know, the council is sort of saying a couple of things. I think we need having that direction. It would be helpful to the to the um, DPW as they as they start to implement, you know, manage requests for streetlights or request to remove streetlights. There's no clarity on that, and I think the council and it's and we can't make it a one on one, you know, a, you know, as requested type thing. But that becomes a little bit chaotic. I think you know, I think it's okay to have exceptions. But I think it is trying to standardize things is a, is a good thing. Um, you know, I think one of the options is to just, you could, you know, if you're not going to get into the level of detail is to give that level of detail to the DPW. Um, and, let, and But I think having some sort of standards is helpful um, because that is the policy decision by the council. But, okay. but to be honest, we don't have the level of expertise on staff that we have for water and sewer. We put a lot of energy and expertise into water and sewer. I mean, that's Amy's sweet spot. We don't have an elect, you know, a light person. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Should I go next? Okay. Yes, go ahead, Sean. Um, yeah, I was gonna say the same thing that imagine doing this without Amy, you know, being there. So similar point, but also hear what Paul is saying that the staff would welcome the research and that Mandy Joe and Amy have brought forward, but also want to then reflect what was suggested in Eve or one of their documents saying that we need actually a lighting consultant because even TAC does not, or maybe Tracy and I mean, they can offer some, but even maybe having a consultant is needed. So that aside, um, I think that um, having standards is good, but coming back to that point is, but having standards that no one can access or use, like we, none of us have seen them or can afford to see them, uh, doesn't make that much sense to me. But what about the other handbooks that they said, like the FHWA 2023 lighting handbook. And so it's not like there would be no standards, but could we also include those other standards offered by those other agencies or resource materials? So that's one question. May I answer? Please, Mandy. So it's possible to add them in. Um, I will read to you um, the description of the lighting handbook provided by the FHWA. So their own description of their handbook. Mm -hmm. um, it's to provide recommendations to lighting designers and state, city, and town officials concerning the design and application of roadway lighting. It is not intended to be a detailed design guide, but serves as a primarily primarily as a resource for policymakers and the design and construction community to evaluate potential needs, benefits, and applicable references when considering a roadway or street lighting system. The primary goal of this handbook is to improve safety using common roadway lighting applications with a focus on how best to apply roadway lighting in various applications and is therefore educational in nature. So it is designed, that that's the quote, it is designed as a handbook, not as standards. The IES is designed based on that handbook as standards. And in fact, the handbook itself identifies the IES RP8, as well as a couple of other different standards, as standards that should be used in it as the standards and referenced as the standards, not necessarily the handbook. So yes, we could put into the policy a reference to this handbook, but it's not intended for the same purpose that the IES RP8 is intended, which looked at, you know, the IES RP8 
is the Illuminating Engineering Society's recommended practice for lighting roadway and parking facilities. So they took, for example, one of the handbooks, you know, as, as even Tracy said, the FHWA handbook is updated much more frequently than the IES RP8 is. Um, and they took some of the most recent handbook guidance and all and said, okay, with that guidance, here are some standards to follow. Um, so, you know, I guess we could potentially but what are we going for? I guess that would be my question to the committee of, are we aiming for standards provided by lighting and roadway designers that are based on the handbook that talks about um, design and application of roadway lighting? Or are we just saying, look at the handbook that's meant to be educational and come up with our own standards based no, on I, an educational document? I, I you know, there's no, a difference there. Yeah, no, no, I get you. So uh, I understand what you're saying is that that is a handbook and doesn't offer a standard, but it's more educational. The other uh, link that they provided of uh, FHWA, that one does say it is quality assurance statement that this provides high quality information to serve government industry in a manner that promotes public understanding standards and policies are used to ensure and maximize the quality, objectivity, utility, integrity of its information. So anyway, all this to say that if you think that the others are not providing standards, of course, I mean, we're looking to provide standards and not just random ideas and suggestions, but uh, if if we can find anything that is more accessible that our DPW staff or anyone else in the future can use as a guideline for standards, then I would suggest that we you know, include those along with the one that you have. But if you think that if you've done your research and you, have fi you find that, um, like I haven't read this whole document, of course, I just looked at briefly. And so it does seem like it's providing standards and policies. So yeah, I'm trusting y'all to find the appropriate standards that are also accessible. Uh, regarding the the separation, I don't think it should be too complicated to separate out. I think I learned that from you, Mandy Jo. What is the difference between a bylaw or a policy and a regulations? And the regulations do go into more specificity and are uh, easier to change. And I mean, I learned all of that from you. So just so that we can have some consistency across, like even as we go into waste hall or bylaw, you know, I can put in, I did a lot of research into what is a pay as you throw model and I can include the specificity in the bylaw but then again it begs the question that are we sure that is the best way to do it and uh, you know does it belong in the bylaw or should be should that be go into the regulation while the bylaw should just provide the guideline that hey we want a rigorous robust pay as you throw model so that's kind of the parallel I'm trying to see between that and and this thank you Shani. Uh, Andy. Yeah, no, this has been an interesting conversation. Um, some of the points that uh, I was going to make have been raised by others, so I'm not going to repeat them. But it still seems to me that if we get, if we get more specific, like um, as I was kidding around about, about bug ratings and um, counselors not understanding bug ratings and assume that they have to do with the mosquito count um, that uh, and then we then you say a future council can change well if we're not understanding and um, we have to assume that at some point uh, that uh, Mandy and Anna won't be on the council how do we know we're going to have a council that is capable of um, doing the kind of research or interested in doing the kind of research um, that um, they have done. And uh, I don't, I'm not confident that that is necessarily something we can assume, which is why policies get frozen in time and then forgotten, never amended. And uh, I think if they uh, are enforced to the letter, uh, they if they're not well thought through at the time of adoption, 
can actually be uh, d dangerous. Uh, and I, I worry about that happening. Uh, the uh, I still am not uh, clear as to why there isn't a way of saying that um, we direct the uh, Department of Public uh, Works to obtain the best lighting possible that achieves the following um, goals, um, does not provide glare, glare um, does not provide more or less lighting than is needed for um, the purpose in the location for which it is placed, that uh, considers cost, that assures that it is focused to the street uh, and not upward to the sky, that it uh, uh, serves the purpose for which it's desired, that, that you put those kinds of standards in and then leave it to the department to exercise uh, judgment based upon the standards and what the suppliers say meet those standards as opposed to just saying, well, uh, whatever the suppliers advise us is the best choice. We're giving them some standards, which I think is really important. So I, I'm, I'm still not convinced that the best approach isn't to uh, trust the department, just give the department some better guidance. Uh, and uh, I guess the question that I have for uh, Mandy and Anna is, have you looked at other policies, bylaws, regulations uh, passed in other municipalities um, seen other municipalities that have um, similar uh, approach taken and the detail taken to what you have? And have you consulted those communities as to how long they have those policies, if they exist, have been in place and whether uh, they have achieved the purpose for which they are um, uh, in, were intended, uh, and so I'll leave with that question. Thank you. Um, so, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Go Thank ahead. You. So in reverse order, and I know that Mandy will give more detail about this, but yes, the answer to your last question is absolutely yes, we have. Um, we, we would not, you know, pitch something that we didn't do our homework on. Um, and then and, and Mandy, I think we'll have better examples pulled up in front of her of the exact cities and towns that we did talk to. But I know we we spoke to, I spoke specifically to the folks in Pepperell at MMA last year about this because we were working on this even last year when we were at MMA. Um, and and you know and and we've they've seen really uh, great success from these programs. They have not seen an uptick in their accidents. They have not seen you know all of the things that we're talking about valuing they are seeing this function in a, in a positive way. Um, and, and I'm sure Mandy will give more detail on that. Maybe Mandy will give more detail on that. Um, to the, to the middle point that you made, the reason why we don't just say all of those things in those, in the ways that you framed it is because they are still incredibly, uh, subjective, right? Upward to the sky can mean all of these different angles. And so when we, when we are thinking about policy that, that folks in DPW specifically are going to have to uphold, we don't want to add stress to their lives by saying, you know, you get to decide on this street, what upward to the sky means. And then this person who's, you know, wants their lighting changed outside their house is saying that it's too upward to the sky, but it's the same angle as over here. And so what we're doing is we're creating consistency and we're eliminating the ability of privileging some folks over others in terms of how the lighting functions in their, where they live or where they are. So we're, we're trying to really eliminate as much of that language that leaves it up for interpretation, because as we know, when things are left up for interpretation, often what can lead from that, what can stem from that are inequities and in how services are rendered or not, again, not by any way by the actions of DPW intentionally at all, but 
because of one person's opinion versus another leads to that that possibility for inequity. Um, and then lastly, to your to your first point, I'm going in reverse order. You know, I think that yeah, there absolutely will be a time I am sure where our streetlight policies need to be updated, and Mandy and I aren't here. And just like with water and sewer, it is the responsibility of the council to serve as the keeper of the public way. Part of that means recognizing and being able to update policies and they should work with town staff like we have on this and others to to make sure that folks are on board or to ask questions about those about the things that they don't know um, but i do trust future councils to recognize that that is part of their responsibility and you know and i don't think that the answer to that unknown is to not pass this um, and i i worry that you know if we if we focus too much on what we don't know, we won't focus on what we need to do now. Um, and so I, I hope that we'll trust future councils to also do their, do their homework and, and learn. And I will let Mandy fill in all of the gaps that I have left, I'm sure. Mandy. So Anna, Anna touched on some of the things. Andy, you mentioned, well, why can't we just say something like minimizing or, you know, meeting the light necessary or desired, I don't know how you worded it, for whatever purpose. You you talked about something about, you know, meeting light levels or illumination levels. Um, well, whose illumination levels? When I stand on the sidewalk and I say, that's way too bright. And someone else says, that's not bright enough. Whose do you go with if you haven't set either a maximum or a minimum? You, you don't have one way or another. If I say, if you just say something about shall not light trespass on someone's property, who determines that and who determines how much light trespass is too much or shall minimize light trespass on a pro property? Well, I currently have light trespass on my property that I think is excessive. And if I go to DPW and say that, and they say, well, it's not excessive. The policy says we should just minimize it. And we've minimized it. And I say, no, you haven't. Well, where is my ability to point somewhere to say, no, you haven't followed the policy when there isn't an actual standard for what minimizing light trespass actually means? So that, that's a little more specific than Anna said. So to your question about where we've consulted, we have talked to clearly the international, the Massachusetts representatives of the International Dark Sky Association. Um, our initial draft of this that has been modified extensively based on comments from not just themselves and other experts from that are also members of the Dark Sky Association, but Eve and Tracy was based originally on the model bylaw and the model code. The purpose of model codes is for experts to get together and draft something that can be used across the nation as a standard so that people who are not experts can know that the that they are receiving expert advice on how to draft and how to and and what to implement if that's their goal. We used model bylaws for um, the technology surveillance tech that was passed by this council, where there I think Andy may have also brought up similar um, technical issues with that, but the council found it okay to pass, even though it was very technical. Um, we used model bylaws for wage and tip theft. Um, we, I'm Amy probably used model regulations for water and sewer regulations. That's that's how things are done. People, legislative experts, get together and use model. But you wanted towns, Pepperell, uh, Northampton, Lewiston, Maine. Um, Santa Barbara streetlight design guidelines, Minneapolis's streetlight design lighting policy, Flagstaff's municipal code, Nantucket's bylaw. Those are just a few. Um, others on my list include Pelham, include um, the County of Hawaii and their ordinances that I looked at, um, Moorhead. Um, yeah, 
those are some of the other ones I looked at. Many of the policies are 30 plus pages long. Lewiston, Maine, as sadly has been in the news today, is about the size of Mass of Amherst. They have about 40,000 residents. Um, so similar size to us. And their policy is nine pages long with specifications on things like this. So we have looked at others. The experts, we've emailed experts in Flagstaff. Um, we have had email conversations with the people who drafted Pepperells, who are lighting experts, who advised Nantucket um, and all of that. Um, and so we have gone to experts. We have reviewed other bylaws that are in effect and policies, lighting policies, call it what you will, sometimes do it as bylaws, sometimes do it as standards, some do it as policies, some do it as ordinances. It's all over the map as to how they've enacted them depending on what they're doing. But we've reviewed them all and most of them are as technical, if not even more technical than what is sitting in front of you today. Thank you, Mandy. Shalini? Um, <clears throat> so I think this is a really helpful conversation. Um, with respect to separating out between policy and guidance uh, and regulations, I think what I'm hearing is that we want some of these things in a policy to provide more guidance that the town staff needs, which even Paul has asked for. So could that guidance be provided in a regulation? So it's not like we're just leaving the, like everything that you have here, could you move some of it? I don't know if it's possible. Like in my mind with the waste, I'm just doing a parallel with the waste hauler. I started out with a more comprehensive bylaw and then I'm trying to now separate out and say, okay, that can go into a regulation. So you're still providing the guidance to the town staff and the regulation, I think, I think that's a struggle many of us are having is that it's so specific without having an active Amy person to from the staff to guide us. Uh, it's feeling very like, how do we vote on something that we're not getting? So if you removed that and put it into regulations and that could be then looked into more detail uh, with, by the task force and so forth, then it takes it away from our plate and then we feel more comfortable. We're all behind everything that's being proposed here. So that's, and, and I mean, that's just to say that there will be guidance provided specific guidance provided to the town staff through the regulations. That's the only difference. The other thing is when consulting, it sounds like the Dark Sky Association provided the model bylaws, but the Dark Sky was not looking at the safety aspects, it seems like. They were focusing on their expertise around Dark Skies. And so I don't think that on its own would be sufficient. However, you did say you looked at other towns. so. Um, that's helpful to know. But just saying that dark sky, because the, being an academic, I know how focused and narrow we can get. We're experts in a particular field, but it may not include uh, other aspects of safety, which requires then people who study safety, road safety and so forth. So I don't know if the dark sky model, uh, at least it sounds like when we started out, it did not include many of the things that Tracy and Eve have brought in a reflection of. So to me, that signals that the dark sky models were not providing a comprehensive look at it. No? May, may I respond? Yes, please. Go ahead. So the Dark Sky Association is an association of people who are looking to, as the name suggests, Mm -hmm. improve the sky situation in town and minimize lighting pollution. In mm -hmm. no way does that suggest they don't consider traffic safety. Um, mm -hmm. They do. The main person we've talked to is extremely concerned with transportation safety as a regular biker commuter throughout the year on roads. Um, and in fact, is part of some of the same listservs that Eve and Tracy have gone to for their support. Um, when they've talked on the transportation network, there is, there is not one of the misconceptions that's been, 
implied in this conversation is that dark sky lighting is not transportation safe lighting. And so we refute the, the, the statement that the dark sky association is not concerned with transportation, transport, transportation safety. Um, they are trying to provide guidelines that do both that say you can have a safe transportation lighting system while also minimizing light pollution. That's their goal is to figure, to recommend and find ways to do both. Um, on the regulation issue, I, I, I will just ask this committee to talk about who adopts the regulations. And then whose job is it to monitor those regulations? The task force we have proposed would be a limited time body looking to add stuff to this policy and propose changes to this policy. And then the task force would disappear similar to the solar bylaw working group who will propose a bylaw and then the working group will be dissolved. Um, so, you know, Shalini, when you talk about can you do a policy and then just move lots of this into regulations, who are you envisioning adopts the regulations is the question I have for the committee. I think the town council would just because there is no other committee, but the town council would know that we've had a combination of experts from tax, from uh, disability advisory, from uh, the sponsors, uh, residents, all of them have looked at this in a, in a deeper way than we have been able to. I know you both have studied this to death, but the rest of us are still grappling with some of the issues. I know you've done immense amount of work. I really do appreciate all the changes and everything that's happened along the way. But it, I think it would just be more consistent around how we do a lot of the other policies and it would allow us to vote on this this part and then allow the task force to do the rest of it and then it gets taken over by the town council that is in the future is going to monitor or and you know do what's needed but but shalini the town council is the keeper of the public way so they are responsible mm -hmm. for updating and passing these regulations mm -hmm. and so it, it doesn't regardless it's going to come to the council and regardless yeah. of how many people look at it as evidenced by this committee being having questions about this that are the same questions that we've been answering for months now they're the same questions i don't know mm -hmm. I, I and i'm genuinely curious how to explain it in a different way that these committees have looked at this. We have emails from TAC members saying that they feel TAC is now overstepping. We have emails from TAC members who still have really long comments. We are now in a point where people are commenting as, as residents, which is absolutely their right, and we appreciate that. But we have asked these committees multiple, multiple times, and we've gotten their feedback. And so, you know, I think that future councils can go back to those committees and should when they update regulations as sh as we should when we update any regulation. But I don't think, I think regardless, any good town council is always going to have questions about this. I don't, I don't, I'm struggling to see what changes by separating it out because regardless, both of them have to come back to the council any anytime that they're updated um, and the council will discuss them at length and and pass them or or not update them. So I think that that's where I'm what I'm challenged by is that we have done the things that you're saying we needed to do. We have done them. We have consulted experts. We've consulted committees multiple times, and so I'm 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 stuck on kind of where's the checkbox here because we want to move on this, and yet mm -hmm. it, it doesn't seem to be enough that we have consulted these committees, and so you know, I'm, 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 I'm a bit stuck on that. And then in terms of the divvying it up, I think, you know, again, I don't, I don't think that we are creating any more or less work by splitting this into two for future councils, because as keepers of the public way, they are going to have to deal with this regardless, um, when it comes back up for, for updates or review. Thank you. Okay. Dorothy, you have been happy. Yeah. Okay. Dorothy, I can come her, back. To Dorothy, you set her hand up. Well, 
here are some figures. Pepperell and Amherst are not the same. Amherst has 23.9% poverty compared to um, Pepperell's 6%. Um, Amherst has 14% people with no car. In other words, we're talking about pedestrians, talking about people walking on the streets and walking at night. So it is very, you know, they're not identical. So we're coming down to the fact we're talking about pedestrian safety, biker safety on the streets and wanting that to be really for, for, forefronted. The other issues are very involved too. So I, I, I just feel, I, I just feel that this is really strange that, that we're talking about the town council getting into this kind of detail. It does not seem to be appropriate to me. I understand making goals and statements and I understand the research on that. Um, trying to find a, a sweet spot between um, human health, animal health, uh, insect health, and pedestrian safety, I think is essential. Um, but, you know, I will still think of people first. Dorothy, I think to that point, then I think that what I'd recommend that you bring forward then is that we figure out how to not make the council the keeper of the public way. Because this is the this is kind of the reality of that part of our responsibility is that it has incredible specificity in it. And so I think that if we don't want to get into the specificity of some of these regulations, then that's a, a larger issue that we should talk about, about why is the council the body that is the keeper of the public way? And does that make sense? Um, and Andy, I know you're going to tell me exactly why the council is the keeper of the public way and give me the big whole history lesson on it. I was asking slightly rhetorically. Um, but I think that, but I, but I think that is the reality of that, right? Is that as keeper of the public way, there are responsibilities that go along with that. Um, and, and I think I also just want to highlight, we, we are very clear that Pepperell is not Amherst, which is why Mandy also referenced a number of other towns that are both larger, the same size and smaller. Um, and again, we have that that information and and we've discussed it before i know but um you know she she spoke about those other towns for a reason we didn't just consult one other town we consult we looked at many other bylaws yeah. I, was, I was i was going to say that uh two things and i'll do one is that we have delegated uh public way um responsibilities to the town manager and second of all the town manager did proposed an alternative um, for our consideration, which was to create a commission. So- um, Parking, right? Parking in streets? No, it was a, trans a transportation commission. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so Sean, I just uh, hold, hold on for a second. Um, I just wanted to try to focus a little bit here, make a suggestion. So, um, you, you know, uh, sp speaking actually, I was, this is personally and, you know, and as, as a counselor, um, you know, so like Dorothy, Dorothy and I are the same district, you know, I am, I, you know, I'm, I'm downtown moving home. There was no other place I would be. So, you know, I, I definitely appreciate and it resonates with me just the, you know, the difference of like in town lifestyle, pedestrian, foot traffic. Um, we need we need light, right? And so I also trusted this lighting and seeing it that it would give us more light. I think one of the just, you know, speaking for concerns around this district. Um, you know, concerns with lighting are definitely, we need we need as much lighting as we can get, as long as they're not, you know, we have some areas where they're glaring, glaring into people's homes unnecessarily. But, um, so my question for TSO, for all of the members, are there specific questions or recommendations that there are for the sponsors where, um, individually, every you would be pleased or not. I think that we know that the research um, has been done. Um, and if there is a, if there is something specific that would you would be satisfied with this policy, are there those questions or you know are are you at a, at a point where you do not see yourself 
uh, voting for this so we can start to get to a consensus of what action that we do or do not want to take as a committee. I think that we are, we have heard to the sponsor's point, we are asking, this has been a great discussion, but some of the questions that we're hearing now have been asked over and over again, and we're hearing the same answers. And I, I don't want to speak for the sponsors, but I don't know if you all have a different answer um, for us. So with that, I'm going to um, and I don't know if the sponsors, if you would like to say some, well, actually, I want to go to Mandy first and then after Mandy, Chalini, please go right ahead. No, I, I, I would like to say, I would ask that TSO remember what the referral was, which, which was to review and make a recommendation on this policy and to remember one that, that we have a policy that was adopted in 2001. And so a recommendation potentially is a choice between the current policy that was adopted in 2001 and this one, or some recommendation in between potentially, right? But that we're not starting from scratch. It's in consideration of what is currently in place too. But that the council, when we proposed this as sponsors, deemed it worthy enough to ask for TSO's time and efforts to make a recommendation on what's been proposed. Thank you, Mandy. Shalini? Um, well, I think my proposal coming in was to separate out the policy from the regulations. I just want to mention a couple of comments that were made, just clarify from what I have heard. Uh, you know, we're saying that TAC has already sent, but what I have heard is there is a lack of clarity amongst TAC members also to the extent they can, they have the authority to speak. And I'm just saying this with um, this is not something to be resolved now, but this is something we have not yet clarified. And that's coming towards the end. I want to bring back the community engagement process again with respect to how we are working with committees, because my understanding is that there isn't, just like the town staff may not feel completely comfortable in speaking up, there is a sense that the TAC does not have complete clarity around how they're supposed to and when and what, what is their role with respect to when a town um, uh, town councilors are providing, uh, are asking for guidance, you know, I don't know, when, when it's already done, like we, it comes in as a done bylaw and we go to TAC, like they are not clear. So I think that's a discussion we need to TS and hopefully we'll have it before, um, the end of our term, but I see Paul's hand up. So if he wants to say something. Yeah, so I will venture in here. Um, so I think what you're trying to do, Anika, is like, where are we on this? And I think like the options are available is to say, the TSO can say, we recommend, we like this, we recommend it, and we mm -hmm. send it on to the council. Option two is to say we don't recommend it or do nothing, in which case the existing, pol as Anna said, the existing policy is, stays in effect and we're, when we're comfortable with that there's it's status quo and then i think the third path i think mandy joe talked about was do you want to do you want to send it to a task force to to start to to dig into it um and say yes we think it needs to be changed um but we're not going i haven't heard, really heard a lot of people dig into like the actual change policy in the regulation say i want to change this sentence or that sentence you know it's been more sort of general discussion i think that's what's frustrating a lot of people um and did it go through the right processes and stuff like that so i think you know this committee really does need to decide what it wants to do um and you work by motions and and votes and so you know you've, you've put a lot of time into this and the sponsors have put an enormous amount of time into it so there's some i think you as fellow counselors you should respect that work whether you agree with it or not um but i think that it's just out of respect for everybody's time it's you know it'd be helpful 
for the this committee to for someone to make a motion so you can vote on it. And maybe there's a fourth option. So I I, use, I always think in threes, but if somebody has a, a fourth option, they can throw that in there. I think, Paul, the fourth option was to do a little bit of options one and three, which were part of it goes to the task force, part of it goes back to the council. That was, which I guess is the proposal. So just to be yeah. clear, I wanted to clarify that like, that's what the proposal is. It's the proposal still does have the task force in it. So you were saying that, sorry, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I mean, there, I guess the other one is to say, hey, we, we sort of like this, um, throw it to staff and have staff bring something back. I mean, I guess that's another option. Whether whether we can actually add value to it or not, I'm not really sure, but I guess well, that's another path forward. Can I ask a clarifying point, Paul? Because we are, by the charter, not allowed to assign work to your staff. So if you are giving us permission to do that, I, I think that that would be, I, would, I, I will speak for myself as a sponsor. Um, I would be fine with that. We would welcome that, but we aren't allowed to do that without your... Sure. I mean, of course, that I wouldn't have suggested it otherwise. If that's what you think is the best. Well, no, I want. I want it like on the record. Yes. A, a Bockelman blessing, which is the official term for that. You got it. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> um, I guess <laughs> I'll confer with. I mean, it's weird to like publicly confer with the other sponsor, but I'm happy to make a motion, and so I want to. I want to just check in with my other sponsor. As to Mandy, if you if it's okay, Anika, if I can ask Mandy, what please thoughts, yes thoughts yeah. are on Paul's four options? Um, gosh, now I have to remember what the four were. <laughs> one was recommend. Two was not recommend. I don't think we're super in favor of that one. Just as the sponsor. <laughs> Three was send it all to a task force, and four was send it to town staff to develop and come back, likely to the next council with. Yeah, so I guess one of my thoughts would be a, a vote on a recommendation is definitely something we've been searching for, right? Like that's that's why we propose this, get it to the council so the council can vote on something. Um and you know, send it all to a task force. I I'm I would be hesitant with that. And I'll say that's because our proposal right now is sort of send half of it to a task force. But in the meantime, here are some standards for the lights that are going in now that are not 23 years old. Um, let's give some guidance now. And so in some sense, I see the send it to a task force is almost recommend this policy, which also includes adopting a task force charge and creating the task force, you know, I, I don't see those two options as too different. I, I will say that, um, you know, I, I would be supportive of directing Paul to direct his staff to come back with a policy on streetlights that covers all of this, um, if that's what the you know, and and then I would support if if they want us sending all of our research to staff for that purpose. You know, I don't have a problem with that, and I'd even be willing to talk to staff about where we were and and everything, including the and and I guess my question around that one would be, what would staff be doing? Both what has been proposed for the task force and what's in this policy, or just this policy part? Because, you know. It, from from a sponsor point of view, the purpose of the task force was to try and bring in the expertise that Paul has said may not exist at staff level for things like lighting zones. Um, so I think if if the if if the committee decides to make a motion to send to staff, it should be clear what staff potentially what part of this staff would be working on. Paul, did you want to respond to that? I, I agree. I agree with that. I mean, I think we want specificity in ter terms of, I mean, I think a vote to send to the staff is saying we want to update our current policy. It's like saying, yes, we want to update it. You know, there's a ton of work and we want to see what this looks like um, from the staff's point of view. What if, if, we, if we, you had to go to implementation almost? Um, I don't think it'll get to the level of detail that this task force would do. Um, so. 
Okay. I, Dorothy, I'm sorry, Anna. Well, Dorothy and then Anna. Dorothy? Okay. Um, I was just going to move that we um, send the recommendation to the task to to the town staff um, for to get their input, and it may turn out to be very simple. You know, but that, that would so, that would. It. Uh, sorry, I think we may need to craft it slightly differently, Dorothy. Right, and I uh, I would go ahead and and ask you to do so. But I think Athena has her hand up for that reason. Oh, Athena. Hi, Athena. Hi. Um, I think what you're trying to do, Dorothy, is make a recommendation to the town council that they pass this to the town manager. They request the town manager spend some staff time because the committee can't refer something to staff themselves. Thank you. Um, thank you. And and there is a uh, this was postponed to November 20, so it would be on the it's on the agenda for November 20. Um, and I think we could probably work in something about the input from finance and GOL when it comes back from the town manager, because that was part of the referral um, back in August when this came back to committees. I think I got it if, if folks want me to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, hang on, one, I'm, I wanna make sure I got it. Okay, so, man, Athena, these motions, okay. It's like a maze of words. All right. Uh, I move Hi. town services and outreach committee to recommend to the town council that they direct the town manager to direct his staff to develop an updated street lighting policy based on the policy titled street lights policy version 13 from the town services and outreach committee packet of 10, 12, 2023 uh, with input from GOL and finance committee upon its return to the council. Sounds good. I, I don't think you need to direct the town manager to direct his staff. You just ask the town manager for something. Okay. And then I figures out how to do it. Parts? Yeah, just I would just take those words out. Okay. You want me to read it again? I'll, do, I'll, I'll just just because I'm proud of it now at this point. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I move for TSO to recommend to the town council that they direct the town manager to develop an updated street lighting policy based on the document titled street lights policy version 13 with input from GOL and finance committees upon its return to the council. Dorothy, did you want to second that? Yes. Okay. All right. So just before we, yes, before we move on to a vote, Shauna, your hand was up. Did you have anything that you wanted to add before we move on? No, I mean, we can do this discussion on this vote and then it, yeah. So, but I, I can speak to this vote. I think what I'm hearing from town, uh, from Paul is that the town staff does not have the level of expertise of sending it to them. I think we uh, the sponsors have already solicited in, solicited information uh, mm -hmm. feedback from them and they've gotten we've gotten what we needed so I don't think that is the right uh, thing I think I'm more interested in a task force where the sponsors work with all these different in a transparent way and they have the public forums and get feedback from residents and all of that to finalize but that's and that's why I was hoping it would be separate that we can vote on something that they've already done as a policy and then the regulations is something that we send to the task force to finalize and take everything that's here you're not starting from scratch but mm -hmm. because this has already been done but then we would have a more robust look at it and get feedback from residents to the public forums and all of that um, and that can be done by the task force. Can I clarify that the policy that we are that we will be voting on includes the creation of the streetlight task force? Thank you. It's in okay. the past. Right. So yeah. it's still there. Okay, Sean. It's still okay. there. What? It's okay. still there. It wasn't taken away. Still there. Okay. All right. Did you have something else, Shalini? No, not for now. Okay. Okay, so I am I'm going to call it. Dorothy. Yes. Andy. Yes. Shalini. 
No. Anna. Aye. And I am an I. So that is the four in favor and one opposed. Thank you, Mandy and Anna for all of your work and TSO for this engaging conversation. I'm not sure if you want to stay with us, Mandy. Thank you for spending this time with us and uh, sweet dreams. Thank you, Mandy. Okay. So without further ado, we are going to move right on. Uh, we're going to move to propose amendments to bylaw 3.3 refuse collection and recyclable materials. I'm sorry, before we start, Dorothy, your hand is up. Yes. Could we please have a five minute break? It's after 830. Yes, we will take a five minute break. So we will be back at I have I have 837. Okay, so that will be 842. Thank you.
Are you ready? I can't believe you didn't hear me shouting from my kitchen as I was filling up my glass of water that I was here while I was on mute. That's shocking. <laughs> All right. Okay. Welcome back. We are going to move right on. Uh, I know we will, um, I'm not sure between Paul and Shalini. Paul, do you have an update or Shalini, do you want to begin speaking? How do you want to do it? Paul, please go ahead. Sure, I can give an update. So where we are right now is uh, we have received, as you know, the responses, uh, three responses to the RFI. Um, Guilford is looking at them. What they did not provide in the RFI, we discovered is we asked for them to send contracts that they had with other communities. Uh, Guilford has assigned one of his uh, interns to track down those contracts because we think that's a pretty important function versus what they say on their on the response. So the question was, will, will, this, will this information be made public? And the answer is yes. I think we have to, um, you know, we really want, staff would really like to go through them first and get the report to the count to the TSO committee. Um, whether he's gonna, the sort of raw responses are one thing and then sort of a, an analysis of the information is a second thing. And that if, I'm not sure where, where Guilford is on that, quite frankly, in terms of, if they are able to get the contracts or not. Susan Waite, and just as another update, has you know con continues to be engaged with this. So it, that's a huge source of uh, expertise that we, and doing it more as a, as a town resident than anything else. So uh, we're really appreciative of, of her commitment to that. So that's where we are on, on the uh, waste hauler stuff. And I, th oh, and the last thing I think, you know, Shalini and I had talked about uh, putting together a roadmap you know, so so the, it, it you know, it's not going to get done this council, you know, whatever it is, and to, to sort of like, what are the steps where would, where to, and sort of try, try to prepare something for the TSO to look at. Um, I think that's what your intention is, Shalini. So th those are my updates. I'm sorry, could I just real quick, Adina, could we, could we bring in Jennifer Taub? Jennifer Taub is in the audience. Mm. Thanks, Anita. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, so I'll just wait a moment for Jennifer to come. Can she hear us while she's transitioning? Yeah. Yes. No. Okay. Yeah? No? Okay. So she's here. Thanks, Jennifer, for being here. Oh, thank you. I forget yeah, you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So um, I think what we are looking to create is a memo that will offer a pathway for the next TSO, I mean, to send to the town council to vote on for the next TSO to take over um, uh, and have a clear pathway not to start from ground zero because we've done a lot of work. So the mem ideally what I'm, I'll share what I'm thinking we can include in the memo, but I'm also open to the committee's feedback, what you would like to see included in the memo in addition to what um, we are proposing. So one, it would include a proposed bylaw. And so we already have a bylaw that we had, uh, that had come from Zero Waste Amherst and the town councilor sponsors had put forward. So taking that a lot, and we, you know, I've spoken with Zero Waste Amherst members and we're working together to recraft what that bylaw is, taking that along with some best practices and everything that we've learned. So to come up with a, very uh, robust bylaw that the next TSO can look at. And then along with that, explain the, have a document explaining the proposed changes and what information is needed to adopt the recommended changes because there are specifics, like, you know, for example, if we are including compost, what will be included in compostables? And that would depend upon uh, maybe waste haulers feedback what they're willing to pick and maybe, th and the cost. So maybe there'll be a basic pickup, including uh, organic waste, but if you want also yard waste, then that might be additional. So those are the kind of decisions that the next one uh, council TSO can make, but we will provide the basic bylaw, the 
uh, a document, a report on the proposed changes, what information is needed, an analysis of the RFI outcomes and additional research on the contracts from, uh, of haulers with other towns that Paul was alluding to that we'll be getting soon. Uh, and then we can provide a history of the waste hauler bylaw and the work with Mass DP in the last round and this round, what we've done so far and where we are right now based on what we know. And then the last recommendation was the creation of an ad hoc committee to, so that is something I'm hoping that we can discuss today. Uh, and that was actually a suggestion that Athena and talking with Athena that she proposed. And I think I really agree uh, with the idea, but I wanted to run it by you. So the reason why I think sending that bylaw to a, an ad hoc committee created by the town council would be a good idea is one, it would, that ad hoc committee would include members of zero waste amers, town councillors, um, residents and uh, board of health, maybe one board of health member. And apparently the board of health had passed something like that, wanted to uh, create something like that. So I think they're on board with it. Um, and I think the advantage of doing that is that we, as a sponsor, I found it was difficult to reach out to different people and then kind of navigate that. But if we had a task force that included all of these different stakeholders to go through the what is being proposed, what are the best practices, and, and they would be able to really focus in on the intricacies and there would be a group of people who are really committed to doing this the right way. So those were some of the reasons for uh, suggesting an ad hoc committee. So I'm open to comments. I can see that Andy already has his hand up. Andy? Yeah, I guess um, uh, you know, uh, to, to be clear to the rest of the committee, the uh, sponsors have not had an opportunity to right. talk about that. We had hoped to do so today, but it didn't happen with everything else that's going on mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, but um, it, I think that it's important that we have a transfer memo and that the transfer memo be as specific and complete as we possibly can. I would like to um, incorporate the goals that we mm -hmm. had long agreed to as the um, as principles that uh, we want uh, understood with as much detail as we can provide, because I think if we're going to set a direction for the next group, I think it's important that they understand what that is. Uh, the uh, additional question about. Uh, how to involve uh, an outside group, in this case, zero waste dammers. Um, I, I think we should get their input, but I don't think that you, I, it is the committee's decision, not, um, and I don't think we should give anything um, to another group. I think it, it does belong back to the committee. It probably should come to the committee through the council sponsors. I've really been pretty consistent on the council sponsors having a specific and larger role. Uh, and of course, we just don't know what's going to happen because we are in election year and all of us are in contested elections. So of the current sponsors, we don't know who's going to be uh, present uh, after January and who's not. So it is important for that reason uh, too, to be extremely thorough and thoughtful about uh, what the transfer recommendation is. So tonight's not the night to do it, but it mm -hmm. is having this discussion. So thank you for bringing it up. Can I just respond to one thing that the ad hoc committee would not be just zero waste. It would have one member from zero waste, board of health, the town councilors, uh, a town staff member, uh, a resident, which could actually be me, because uh, I'd be a resident then. So, so it would be a combination of people that uh, would be able to do a deeper dive. But again, I'm not attached to it. I'm just offering that. Do you? So the question really is: Do you think 
the next TSO is the body that can do a deep dive into it based on all the information we're providing them. And you think, because I've known that some of the things that came from last carryover, we're doing it now at the end of the second year. And it was, so do you all feel that the TSO is the body or maybe TSO can decide when they get that information to consider creating an ad hoc committee? So that's another option. Yeah, and I would tend to do do what you said at the end, which is not create a task force now, but mm -hmm. uh, um, leave it to a decision of the next TSO because, as I indicated, we don't know. Some of us might be back. Some of us might not be back. We right. if, uh, if uh, uh, there are a few of us who are back and. Uh, you know, we might uh, just be able to pick up where we left off. Uh, task force is just creating another body, and it gets back to the uh, point that I've made in the prior discussion that I think we need to be extremely cautious about doing that because they uh, we're just creating we create too many uh, separate committees or whatever you want to call them. Uh, mm -hmm. task forces committees i think that it just uh becomes more more and more difficult about who supports and coordinates it and um it can actually get lost or become less efficient so i'll let jennifer take over and i'll <laughs> thank you andy uh, jennifer i i <clears throat> well i i tend to agree with andy um i was just wondering who would the task force the task for it would be a task force of TSO or of the council, of the council. Or wait, Athena has a comment because she's the one who suggested it. Yeah, yeah I my, my suggestion was that the the council create an ad hoc committee like they did for the Solar Bylaw Working Group, so it would just mm -hmm. be a specific committee to work on um, developing the changes to the waste hauler bylaw. So then it would come out of TSO. Or, or it would be referred back from the task force, just TSO. Oh, and then to the right now, right now the referral sits in TSO. TSO could recommend the council create an ad hoc committee, um, and that could be TSO's recommendation. But it would be the council that creates the ad hoc committee. Mm -hmm. um, but like Andy said, that suggestion could also go in the carryover report. Um, there, there is. Um, and we'll know, I think, by the next meeting, um, if there are sponsors who will be on the next council, because the carryover works a little bit differently if there are no sponsors of a mm. uh, measure that are going to be on the next term. I think it disappears. I think the charter actually says that. No, it it doesn't die. It's 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 that everything is carried over unless there's not a sponsor left, and so. To not carry something over, the council votes not to carry something over. But in this case, if there were no sponsors left, then the council would vote to carry it over. Oh, okay. So they can. So okay. they can carry it over. Or, but, or they cannot. No... Or they can decide not or to. They... So it's right. automatic unless there's no sponsors left or unless it's it received is. a negative recommendation. And then the council would vote to carry it over. Okay. So I still have a question, um, if I could. Um, so mm -hmm. if, if, if this went... The recommendation was made, and it was like the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Then, would the task force report? It would be a, like the Solar Bylaw Working Group reports to the town manager, right? No, they're going to bring a, um, the the bylaw to the council. Okay, but I would tend. I think that's. I would think that's not a decision. We have the TSO would necessarily have to make now. I mean, we no, haven't. TSO doesn't have to make it now. TSO right. can include that idea in a carryover memo right. if you feel like that, that's something that you'd like the, the next iteration of the committee to consider, but um, they wouldn't have to. It could just be part of the, the summary of the committee's conversation about this. Can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so, do, um, Paul, do you think we'll have the um, analysis of the RFI responses before the end of the council session? I would hope so. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm making all these promises mm -hmm. because it's not me doing the work. So, right. um, so, but it seems like it would, I mean, yes. I mean, I think everybody who's, I would say yes. I mean, it's, it's 
two, you've still got six weeks or two months. I mean, for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I saw your hand go up. Yeah, I just had a kind of a technical question. So in terms of timing, couldn't, so we'll know on November 8th who will be seated in the next council. And hypothetically speaking, if an if a this is such a weird hypothetical, please bear with me. If a counselor joined as a sponsor who would be in the council in the next term but was not an original sponsor, would that still count towards the carryover? Hmm. Just to get let's out of cross way. that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> I think it, it doesn't matter when be... the sponsor signed on as long as they are mm -hmm. hypothetically um, right. This is this is the council passing what exists in council and committees to the next council. And so there wouldn't be a new councilor sponsor before it's passed over. So so this council not a new councilor, council sorry. I, I, I apologize. Oh, you mean an existing councilor? Oh, yeah. oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think we should we should uh, put a pin in that until the next meeting and we'll, we'll know for sure and then we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah, Dorothy. Okay, Kim. Because somebody has been elected, they're still, they still can't serve. They can't volunteer. They can't do anything until January. I was 1st. not suggesting that at all. No, I right. meant hypothetically, if I signed on as a, I, hypothetically, right. Because I know that I'm going to be on the next council. Hypothetically, right. if I signed on as a sponsor now, regardless of what happens to the other sponsors in the next term, mm -hmm. this would be carried over. Please sign on. on. <laughs> I hypothetically was just asking for clarity yes. in the process. And <laughs> so we can do you have a new council council, not new, I mean a current TS. No, I'm talking about you. Can you sign on? Basically, yeah, can we invite you to sign on as a sponsor right it doesn't now. need to be me I, I was just curious because no, even but... after november 8th we'll know right so i was just i was kind of but curious. you're a guaranteed uh and given your interest yep, in and i'm not trying to talk change. myself into anything at this moment i just was curious okay. after after that point okay so welcome. that's good so we have that option to have a sponsor to carry it forward so that's good to know because that was one of the concerns for it but even, you know, even without something. even without a sponsor the council can just vote to carry it over you don't need to have an, another sponsor so okay yeah i didn't want just wanted to make sure we're on the same page okay. if there's not, if there's not a sponsor that will continue on the council can still it the council would vote to carry it over rather okay. than yeah. not to carry it over like it does with things that are automatic mm. okay um so i think again I, I just want you all to think about as having been on TSO and the work that we do. And if we, let's say we were the same group going to be in the next council, would you like to do the work of going through each of these bylaw recommendations and uh, doing the community engagement and all of that? Or would you prefer that there was a committee of different stakeholders like Board of Health, all of them doing the deeper dive and then coming to TSO with their recommendations. Which option would you prefer? Could you repeat that, Sean, please? Yeah, sure. So just given your experience on TSO and imagining that if we were the TSO moving forward, the same TSO, and you had an option, that you can that we can be the ones who will now take this RFI analysis, take the bylaw proposal with the pay as you throw model options, um, the different composting, the town contract that potentially we would like to move towards. All of the details of that. Do you think the TSO has a time and bandwidth to do a deeper dive into all of these pieces? Some of it is going to be bylaw but then to really make it work there is no other body like similar to lighting there is no other body technically it's the board of health but they have already said we don't have the bandwidth to go through the regulations so they will need a support to get the regulations done so regardless whether you know um, whether the tso does it or but 
or should we have an ad hoc committee or task force to go through and finalize the, you know, the details that would, most of them would be part of the regulations. Mm -hmm. Anna, your hand is up. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll chime in after. I mean, well, I have, I have strong thoughts. I, I think, I mean, I've said this before. Yeah. I just I really, I really would like to um, not be navigating some of those more nitty gritty decision-making points in committee. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I would be much more supportive of a group coming up with those decision points, like making those decisions mm -hmm. and then bringing mm -hmm. them to TSO to say yay or nay or have questions on. But I, I think for me, I, I think the best use of the committee's time is is not necessarily spent getting into the the weeds of crafting something. And I, if I'm understanding mm -hmm. your question correctly, right? So that would be my, if you're asking for our, our right. thoughts, that would be my Yeah, thought. no, yeah. And I, I think the, well, the way we've been doing things and how legislature works is that there's an expectation that they will be a bylaw crafted based on best practices and to the best of our, and yet there are some decision points that will need to be made by whoever, like I said, in terms of what exactly will the pay as you throw model entail. And that requires the feedback of the waste haulers. So, um, and and also our town staff, what is their capacity and and at some point we'll involve the finance committee to look at do we need additional employees or what is that going to look like so that's a there i'm not even going there but just in terms of the like there is going to be a proposed bylaw that is coming forward but even within that there are going to be decision points and so what i'm hearing you say is that you would rather have a committee look at or a task force look at those decision points and then send the recommendations to tso that would be my personal preference is the ad hoc committee would do those, those. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I would agree with that. Oh, you're done? Mm -hmm. So go ahead. I would, I would agree as well. I think that, you know, this is, uh, you know, this bylaw, this is something that impacts every single resident. And I think that if you go back to our initial conversations, that was, I think, this was a concern. It wasn't that, you know, anyone wasn't in support of the idea, but it was just looking at the time that we have within TSO, like how, mm -hmm. how do we have, how does this happen? Um, just, you know, within the time here and, and even with, and this is why I think it was, you know, when, when you had John in January, asked to, to be able to lead this effort and work with the sponsors. But even so, you know, you have you have counselors that are on many committees. So I think that having um, a group that can really, you know, has dedicated time um, to, you know, really, you know, dive in and, and figure this out, consult with who they need to consult with, you know, making sure those educational components really, you know, go through, they're able to, you know, keep up with, with times. I mean, you know, things change so quickly, you know, with options. And so, you know, I, I think that that would um, be the best, in my opinion, the best service for the residents of, of Amherst, the best way that mm -hmm. that's what they would deserve. I think more than the time that TSO alone or, or any committee rather could, could give along with everything else that comes down the pipeline, especially for TSO. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anika. And that, that's exactly, Anna and Anika, that, those were exactly my thoughts about why I was thinking that I had ad hoc committee uh, when Adina you know, recommended. I'm like, yes, that makes complete sense. And then especially as a sponsor also running and trying to get a hold of different people and making sure that I'm hearing everyone correctly and they're hearing me correctly. There were definitely some gaps in our understanding along the way, but making it a transparent process where there are five or six, you know, five members mm -hmm. who are at the table at the same time uh, and, and then doing the public forums and community engagement and yes. all of that, and then sending the final recommendation to the TSO to, mm -hmm. to discuss. Jennifer? Yeah, my question was just, I guess, to Paul. Would so there would have to yeah. be a, a staff person. Or we would have to have a contract for someone to do something. We'd have to get money for it. 
Okay. Just that that's, that's, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I, it depends what the level of staffing, I mean, if we're taking minutes and all that kind of stuff, that's a pretty high demand for, um, mm -hmm. for it. And, you know, if it depends if you're looking for clerical support or if you're looking for someone with sub, su subject matter expertise. Um, so I think, again, we, it, it, it'll, you know, we will want to think through what that means for our staff. I mean, right. Right. That, that's sort of the stressor on our, on our, a lot of our staff right now. You know, and we just lived through the solar bylaw, which took a mm -hmm. lot of staff time. And so we sort of learned from that a little bit about what the commitments are. So. Right. What would, um, what, like, if you were to move forward with an adult committee, Paul, what, and what, how, what is the limit? Like, we don't want to make it uh, an additional burden, but just what is the minimal because we, I believe we do need a staff person, I guess, for the minutes, but. Well, no, I mean, the committee can take its own minutes. There's no requirement yeah. for a paid so we person don't to take really minutes. Need... So, so yeah. it, it's just a matter, we would have to, I don't think it's t worth talking about here, but I think okay. that that's, okay. Okay. I mean, I think there's different levels of staffing, if any staffing, uh -huh. you know, okay. like what, what the expectations are. Okay, I hear you. Athena? Um, Anika, if I may, please. Um, I, I think I think that you know, getting into the weeds a little bit. I think it's helpful mm -hmm. to know if the committee wants to right. make a recommendation to the council on an ad hoc committee before the end of this committee's term, or if the this TSO wants to include that idea in in the carryover memo. I'm sorry, Athena, my, I don't know what's going on. I'm just, you like went out right in the middle of what you were saying. Could you repeat that? Um, I think the, the rather than getting into the weeds of a, an ad hoc mm -hmm. committee charge right now, it would be helpful to know if the committee wants to act on um, an ad hoc committee charge, make a recommendation to a council in this term, or if you just want to include that idea in the carryover memo to the next TSO because mm -hmm. that'll help inform what happens at the next meeting if if mm -hmm. somebody's going to be drafting a charge or if somebody's going to be working right. on that part of the carryover memo. Right. So and to I'm the sponsors. Just doing a time check. It's almost it's a little yeah, so yeah, so um, that it is it's we have we're coming after right. uh, we're at 10 after. So if we could come mm -hmm. to that conclusion then you know this will be that would be helpful. Yeah because, that would just for right. the draft. Sorry, that would be super helpful because for the next committee meeting, TSO meeting, then I can, I mean, the bylaw is already pretty much written. So the, all of those pieces are going to be in it, but then we'll have this additional, if we are agreeing today, then they could be a, dra a draft of the committee charge. That's well, we would included. need this. Yes, I'm sorry, Dr. but we will need this before because the draft, the draft of the carryover will be for the next meeting. So this won't continue. Right. So right now we have, so we have all of the information. So anything additional, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that you would want to be included in that draft, we would need then ASAP. So then we would be able to, as a committee, look at the draft together and, you know, make mm -hmm. sure everyone's, you know, we go, we go from there. Right. So the draft of not the memo you're saying, but the draft of the bylaw. Or if there's a charge for the new committee, all of that needs to be sent to you ASCP, is what you're saying. Yeah, sure. But can we decide today whether we feel ready to act on the ad hoc committee charge, or do we want to just include it in a carryover memo that then the next TSO will vote on? Uh, yeah, so I think just can we hear what from from you and Jennifer as, as sponsors, just what do you think? Which which are you thinking as sponsors? I'd like to know. Jennifer? I mean, I was thinking that would be a suggestion for the carryover mem memo, not that it would be formed before mm -hmm. that. That would be my thinking. Yeah. Sean, are you in agreement? Um. I mean, I think there are pros and cons. I think 
doing that as a carryable memo, then it just delays it more that then the next TSO is going to have a whole conversation, a couple of maybe meetings, and then decide to vote on it. And so it's just like, if we are going to include it in a carryable memo, then I feel that we are agreeing with, and we should do it now because then the next when they start, they will they can just get going right away without wasting more meetings and voting and all of that. And it allows the us to start pretty much as soon as possible. So well, I'm feeling good about an ad hoc. Like I would say I would include, I would, I would like to act on the ad hoc committee charge, but I also want to hear from Andy. Can I just ask a question, Athena, for clarification? Um, I tend to just first off agree um, just from the, the past conversation with, with Jennifer's suggestion because if we haven't seen, you know, a charge and there's a lot that we haven't seen. So if we were to hmm. move on something now, right? So, um, but anyway, you, you mentioned Andy. Did Andy, did you have your hand up? Or, or Shawna had just asked for your... I did not have my hand up. Uh, and just in the general terms, I would like to see what we're talking about with a uh, task force of any kind uh, mm -hmm. to, as to what the charge in the company, uh, who's on, who's proposed to be on it before mm -hmm. I could say whether we could recommend it or not. This is not something that has been subject to discussion or thought. Uh, I'm uh, a little bit hesitant to jump into a decision mm -hmm. too quickly as to whether yeah. to recommend it or not. Uh, but I think what is most important for me is that uh, we come out of it with a strong recommendation that this needs to continue um, and uh, the, the reasons why and uh, a structure that sort of guides that to happening and it seems like we're moving in that direction. Yeah. There's a town manager goal that wouldn't change. Is that, is that correct, Athena and Paul? The council hasn't voted on the 2024 goals yet. That's uh, in GOL, but yep, the, the council hasn't voted on it yet. It'll come up before the end of the year. Thank you. Anna? Yeah, I just, I was just looking at the packet we haven't seen sorry i it's past nine and it's been a long week yeah. um, we haven't seen the charge for this committee right i think because that's mm -hmm. i'm not comfortable voting the committee without seeing the charge like typed down mm -hmm. right now um, yeah. but i am comfortable putting this on the um on the carryover men <laughs> it's a menu memo <laughs> um <laughs> And if, if I, that I am comfortable with, but I, again, like I'm not, I don't want to get anywhere close to approving a charge that we haven't seen. Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I think the question was to get a sense if you all would want me to draft a charge for the next meeting, or if you don't have time for that, then, then we just include it in the carryover memo. And Athena. Any thoughts? Yes, please, I can. Um, it sounds, it's, uh, my, my suggestion would be that, um, Shalini, you you take on the work of that part of the carryover memo and bring it to the mm -hmm. committee at the next meeting. And if you want to draft a charge um, to include in the carryover memo as a suggestion, then the committee can look at it in, as part of the carryover memo. Okay. Sounds that good. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Great. Thank you. All right, everyone. We oh oh yes, no. and and whatever something agenda items. Um, can we also include bring back the community engagement? We had a first conversation, and I made edits and changes based on what we talked about. Can we bring that in the coming, whenever, but in the coming TSO meetings? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and okay. I'll follow That's up. All. Okay, so Thank you. Right, we are we are here light. We do not have appointments this evening unless anyone has an announcement. Um, I think you know it'd be fitting for us to close. That many of us, I think most 
of you that I see here. We all attended the celebration of life for uh, Demetra Shabazz. And so, you know, we can close thinking of her and we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. All.